Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Gardner Center for Asian Art and Ideas. My name is Haley, and I'm the manager of public engagement at Seattle Asian Art Museum. Thank you for joining us today. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Seattle Art Museum respectfully acknowledges that we are on indigenous land, the traditional territory of Coast Salish people. We honor our ongoing connection to these communities past, present, and future. The 2022 Saturday University Lecture Series, Architecture of Asia, Sacred Spaces and Cultural Landscapes, explores architecture, sacred spaces around Asia with focus on built environment in midst of the ongoing climate crisis. Today, we have a great pleasure to hear from Dr. Luisa Cortesi. Luisa will deliver a talk titled, The Shape of Water, The Reimagining the River Ganges in Northern Bihar, India, and take us on a journey from the floodplains of Himalayas to the very northern part of India, not only as a region of most extreme flood, but as a site of ecological belonging and discuss how flood collides with culture and life. Before we hear from Luisa, I want to take a moment to thank our long-standing partners, the Jackson School for International Studies at the University of Washington, and also thanks to Dr. Mimi Gardner-Gates for her guidance and support to our trustee members and museum members who allow Sam to do the work of connecting art to life. I also want to thank the team at SAM that make this program happen, our communication team, security, IT, facilities, and visitor experience. Without their support, this program won't happen. In addition to Dr. Cortese, I want to give a warm welcome to the Future Rivers, our collaborating partner for today's lecture. Future Rivers is a National Science Foundation granted funded program focused on training the next generation of freshwater sustainability scientists at the University of Washington. Currently, the program hosts students from nine different departments in five colleges. They learn how to bring a deep justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion to their work, practice enhanced communication, and deepen their knowledge of applied transdisciplinary data science. The Future Rivers program aims to help solve some of the today's most complex climate-related challenges. Um, with respect to the freshwater ecosystem and global population that depends on them. We are thrilled to have them here as a part of Saturday University. So warm welcome to you. A little bit of announcements now. This lecture will be recorded and made available online on Sam's YouTube channel in the coming weeks. The talk will last about 50 minutes and we will have up 30 minutes of Q&A and moderate discussion. Um, next slide, please. Um, next slide, please. Your participation today in this program entitles you to visit the Asian Art Museum after the presentation is over. There's much to see in this museum, including the Beyond Mountain, contemporary um, Chinese artists on the classical forms. Also, please don't miss the new installation of American art galleries at Sam Downtown, American Art, The Stories We Carry. Next slide, please. Um, this has been a two year long exploration with artists, community leaders, scholars, and students. Um, and la next slide, please. And lastly, our upcoming new exhibition this fall, Dawood Bay and Carrie Mae Weems in dialogue Visions of Black America for two celebrated photo-based artists. Now onto today's presentation. Dr. Luisa Cortesi is an anthropologist, environmental scientist, and development practitioner. She earned her PhD in anthropology and environmental studies at Yale University and did postdoctoral research at Cornell University. She's now an assistant professor at the International Institute of Social Studies at the Erasmus University in the Netherlands, as well as Mary Curie Fellow at the Freiburg Institute of Advanced, Advanced Studies in Germany. She has worked with NGOs and United Nations in India, Sub-Saharan Africa for several years, and she founded Water Justice, Justice and Adaptation Lab, a platform for collaborative work between scientists and committees on water-related environmental justice. After our presentation, Luisa will be joined on stage for a conversation and Q&A with Athena Bertolino, a project manager for our partner Future Rivers. 
who has more than 20 years of experience in the environmental field. Prior to joining the Future Rivers, she spent 14 years as a strategic advisor and project manager working to address regional watershed and land use planning. Athena holds a master's in international studies and a graduate certificate in conservation biology policy from the United, I'm sorry, from University of Washington. Now please join me in welcoming Louisa to the stage. Hello, good morning everyone. Thanks Hali and Keila and Athena for inviting me and to all of you to, for being here on a Saturday morning. I'm humbled. And thanks also for the wonderful introduction. I think I, it's, it's gonna be hard to stay up to the expectation you just created about me, Hali. So since you already know too much about me, I wanna start with you. How are you doing? Are you sitting comfortably in this wonderful auditorium? The reason I'm asking this is because I want to talk to you about knowledge and how knowledge is situated, which means that what you know also depends on who you are and where you are. Not only, but also. So I want us to acknowledge our identity and our context as a precondition to operate an epistemological leap. I have already revealed myself as an academic by using one of those big words, epistemological. I thought to spare you from it, but let's flatten the hump straight away. Epistemology is nothing else than the way in which we know. So an epistemological leap is a leap is a jump, a change of position, towards a different way of knowing something. So it's important for us to acknowledge where we are starting from in order for us to try to know something different from what we generally know, or for us to know something in a different way from the ways we generally use for knowing something. We'll remain here and also be elsewhere. We'll remain who we are, but we'll also put ourselves in other people's shoes. Let me introduce you to Rakesh. Rakesh is 11 years old and can barely write his name. He doesn't know how to write much because where he lives, school teachers don't really want to go. And because his family need, needed him to work from a very early age. And yet, Rakesh is knowledgeable, very knowledgeable, about a lot of things that none of my four master's degrees, nor my dual PhD, for that matter, ever taught me. And this knowledge that Rakesh masters is not only essential for life in the area where he lives, but it's increasingly important in the area where I live. And I suspect, most likely, also in the area where you, or many of you, live as well. I ask Rakesh, to close his eyes and to image in my words. I propose to him, it's a hot summer night and he's sleeping outside in the place where we are, a crossroad. It's common for most the North Bihari I know to sleep outdoors in a public place, so there is nothing strange here. I ask him to imagine that he wakes up in the middle of the night with the sound of rumbling water. What are you thinking, Rakesh? What are you feeling, I ask him. I'm listening to the water. He answers, matter of fact. Is the sound a clock, clock, clock? Or a shh sound? He continues. Is it dip and thick? Or is it a shallow, empty sound? I'm caught by surprise. Not only I assumed I was gonna ask the question, but I don't know what he's talking about. But I follow him. The first one you said, a clock, clock, clock. And where is the water coming from, he asked me. I don't know, I choose to answer. You tell me, where is the water coming from? Where could the water come from? Well, from southeast most likely, he says. This boy, I think, he doesn't know how to read, but he uses precise geographical location. Well, if it's a clock, clock, clock then, 
The water is not coming from north, he replied. Why so? Because if it's a clock, 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 and it's coming from the north, it can be only the Buri Gandak that is stopping the railway track. And what if the sound is coming from southeast? I press Rakesh. Rakesh. Well, if it's coming from southeast, it's probably a shallow sound. Because that would mean that this is the Ganga that has crossed the plantation. But what if the sound is deep and thick? Well, this could be because the whole area is not flooded yet, so the water is coming straight here. Rakesh, at this point, brings me with him into a complex decision tree. He considers the sounds, the clock, 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 or the shh. He considers the quality of the sound, whether it's shallow and empty or thick and deep. And he considers the direction from which the water comes in. In condition X, Y, and Z, he would go northeast to spot A. In condition Y, W, and Z, he would go southwest to spot B. In condition X, W, and J, he would instead go to spot C, which is northwest. But in condition J and Z, he would go again to spot A, northeast. Bihar is known as the land of floods. The north part of this Indian state, just below Nepal, is the playground of seven major rivers. And there are numerous tributaries that rush from the Himalayan range to the river Ganga, which then continues to run west till the Bay of Bengal. This river floods since immemorial times, but most dangerous, dangerously, as we will see, for the last four decades. This is why most Biharis who live in the rural areas, in the riverine areas, even children with no formal education, are virtuosos in the knowledge of dangerous water. And this is also why I work there on and off since 2007 for several years, because the Bihar is the place where the consequences of climate change have been happening for several decades already. So it is the place to answer the question that inspire my academic work. I'm interested in how people understand the world that is rapidly changing and dangerously so. How do we learn to live in a disastrous world? Particularly, I'm interested in disasters of water, of too much water, such as floods, or too dirty water, such as drinking water contamination. When I went first to Bihar in 2007, it was because I was hired by a few local small NGOs to help them rethink their work on water disasters. After two months I was there, the rivers knocked down the banks in several locations, and 25 million people were underwater for months for what the UN considered as the worst flood of the century. The next year, we beat the hots with another worst flood of the century. Later, during my PhD, I went back to Bihar for another three years period to do research fieldwork. Having established a working relationship with a local college from the state capital, I was asked to offer an internship to a few boys that were about to graduate with brilliant grades from a degree in environmental studies. I agreed and brought them with me to a village where I could provide for their accommodation. As we reached, I was welcomed by a few kids the age of Rakesh, who came along as we went for a tour of the area. As I asked questions to the students, the local kid became more curious and started to participate. But it quickly became evident that only the local kids could answer my questions. The urban college graduates had no sense of the geography, the biology, the ecology, the hydrogeology, the flora, and the fauna of the area. Instead, if the rural kids' formal education was very basic on reading, writing, and maths, they were masters in their environment. Not only the information they already had, but the logic, in the logic queries I was proposing, it became obvious that their ability to seek for, to acquire, to process more information, their capability to evaluate complex environmental scenarios. By virtue of comparison, they seem like the one getting a college degree in environmental knowledge. This is not because the quality of college education is bad, but perhaps it's because I understand environmental knowledge differently. 
Yet, who am I to judge anyone's environmental knowledge? I am no pro. In Bihar, I had to learn not only how to express myself in different languages, but also how to conduct primary physiological operations such as walking. To my excuse, I can say that walking on a muddy path is a different kind of walking. <laughs> More generally, in every type of walking, every step a person takes involves taking a risk. When a biped raises their front foot, they lose the balance a little bit. Do you want to try? Please step up from your seat for a second. Do you mind? If you can, you don't have to. If you don't mind, let's try it. So imagine the terrain in front of you is slippery. It's very slippery. How would you go about moving your foot the next step? Just the fact that you raise your foot requires you to unbalance yourself, do you feel it? To sort of shift your weight from two feet to one. And if you realize you were on a bog, how would you put your front foot forward? Would you be tentative, like afraid of slipping? Would you go down with your heel first or with your toes first? With your toes first. Yeah, many people think the toes first, huh? Yeah, who says the toes first? Ah. And who says the heel first? Oh, sort of, we are sort of even. Well, thanks for your collaboration, but neither would be a good idea. <laughs> if you are on a slippery surface, and let's open a presenter. This skill is actually useful even on icy roads, for that matter. You can, so I'm sorry to keep you standing, you can totally get to the game. You better take that risk quickly. So to take a small step, put the whole foot down, transfer the weight quickly forwards with no hesitation. This is not obvious, isn't it? No. So can you imagine how difficult it was for me to learn all of that without anyone explaining any of that? Because everyone else in Bihar already knew how to step on mud, so I couldn't find instructions anywhere. I'm not only gonna bring you to Bihar today. Let's take a quick detour to a little island in the Mediterranean Sea. Let's see if I get a pointer. Is this a pointer? Oops, what did I do? It's probably, okay, here. Can you see it over here? It's a volcanic island with three volcanoes in just five square kilometers, surrounded by deep sea in all directions. Here, I want you to meet Marco and Gianni, aged, age, aged 21 and 19, respectively. One evening, we went for a dinner at a local restaurant with Marco and Gianni's parents. When we ordered dessert, Marco refused any and became restless. He soon got up and left. I smiled and commented at Marco's mother, Elisa, it must be the age of first love affairs. No, 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 she says, he's going fishing. Well, mothers are, you know, are always the last to know, I'm humble. But she was right. Before going back home, we went to check on Marco and his friends catch. Instead of going to a movie, to a party, to a friend's house, to play video games, to dance, to drink, to smoke, Marco went out to fish with his friends in the dark night. Instead of buying beers, they bought fuel for the boat. And we are not in Bihar. This is not because Marco can't afford the video game. I work, he says. I could pay for the PlayStation by myself. But instead, he saves to get hooks, baits, rods, and weights. This is because Marco and Gianni love the sea and enjoy fishing with their friends more than anything else. It's a challenge offered by the sea. Powerful, mysterious, that upsets your balance and requires you to work hard to learn the skills to confront it. 
but it rewards, it rewards you. Marco's brother Gianni tells me, with calm, with colors, with peace. This is a photo he sent me last night, from last night's sunset. Those sensations can only be found at sea. So the sea calls you back, like a healthy drug on which you rely on to find yourself. When Marco and Gianni were small kids, they told me, they would become friends with tourist kids. Over them, however, they had an advantage. They knew stuff that the other kids didn't. How to immerse themselves in deep water, how to orient themselves at the sea, how to read the currents and the winds and the waves, to maneuver boat and to detect animals alike. Which plants could be eaten and how, how to run barefoot on rocks on which the outsiders could not even walk. But when Marco and Gianni, two young, trendy Italians, go out to the mainland, they similarly feel a fish out of the water. Strange traffic signs, tall buildings, the fact that to go around the city, you need to learn the street's name, you can just find your way there. In their habitat, Gianni and Marco have sets of decision trees, just like Rakesh. For example, walking with them on the rocks of the island, I had to learn how to walk one more time. It's okay, you don't have to learn how to walk again with me. But Gianni explains to me, very seriously, that in geological times there have been three eruptions on the island. With each eruption came a different type of rock. So knowing the rocks, which are often mixed, will help you to know what, to, what your stepping foot will find. So at every step on the rock in front of the sea, I had to think as quickly as possible which color, which material, which size, how stable, how friable, how sharp for the rock above and for the rock below. Imagine you are out at sea, tells me Gianni, and the boat is taking in water. You need to consider how big is the boat and which type of boat, how powerful the engine, how much fuel you have, how much water is getting in. From there, you can decide whether you can go faster, which on certain types of boat will cause the bow to rise up upwards. This is what you want in order to unplug the leggio, a drainage hole in the stern of the boat, from where you can get rid of water faster than scooping it or pumping it out. I suspect someone in the audience is thinking, okay, you know what? I can do with my car the same thing that Johnny does with his boat at every crossing, every second I'm, I'm driving. I'm considering all of those. Who else is on the road? How fast are they traveling? Which kind of intersection this is? How likely is that they'll stop in time? Sounds, colors, shapes, intervals, movements, synchronies, sequences, speeds, durations. So here's my question for you. Which factors would you be able to consider to wait in to combine, not while driving or sailing, but when, while living in your habitat, but with more water than usual. The car is, an habitat for some, is a habitat for some of us, the boat is a habitat for others, but our mainland habitats are going to get wetter and wetter. My friend Susanna is an intellectual property lawyer married to a NASA scientist. A polyglot, she has lived in many countries, is comfortable in many habitats, including rough environments. She operates as a lawyer from anywhere in the world, and she's used to take consequential decisions on a whiff, much more than a university professor like me, for sure. So just to give you an example, she, has, she was telling me she has the first aid uh, certification, the first aid in the wild certification, the avalanche certification. She's gone hiking anywhere. Last month, I was texting with her, and in a second, our texting took a different turn. So now, this is a flood warning. If anyone feels they could be triggered, please be aware. Rains heavily. The road looks like a river. Where are you? I'm getting scared. Two adults, two kids in the car. Call emergency responders. Tell me where you are exactly, and I'll also call them. 
you need to consider getting out of the car. The car can be carried away by the water. Cars are not made to travel on water. It's raining a ton. Feels like a lose-lose situation to abandon the car. You may have to get out. The water can sweep the car away. Look in front and on your back before deciding where to go. Where is the water coming from? Consider if there could be debris, trees, boulders coming from above. Is there a slope upstream? Avoid bridges if inundated. The road is a river, water in the car. Go, take the kids, leave everything else. Don't panic, stay calm. If you're trapped in the car, remove belts. Lower the car window, try to swim out. Later, she says, it was so quick. The car was swept down by the water, but reached the pole that held it. The till the firefighters rescued them. She told me there had been forecasts of heavy rains, but people were happy about it because the rain would give respite to vegetation and soil that had been dried up by the long scorching summer. Yet, and this is counterintuitive, soil is at its most porous, therefore absorbent, when it's already a little damp. Parched, baked soil is most likely impermeable, like concrete. Less trees, more agricultural land, less permeability. So it is the lack of knowledge on which factors to consider and what to process together that led Susanna and her local friend to misread the signs of a heavy flood and therefore put their life and their children's life at risk in a small rivulet that suddenly metamorphosed into a flash flood. This is not only the layman ignorant, ignorance. Let's go back to Bihar. When describing the surface of their mesoscale, the culturally pro significant proportion of North Bihar where they live, locals mention not only administrative territorial names such as district, but also infrastructure, namely embankments, bridges, roads, railways, the landmarks, the landmarks to which they orient themselves. In so doing, they reveal the superficial space is organized through a Cartesian grid. Rakesh's great-grandfather, whom I respectfully call Babaji, recounts that during his childhood, the British, before building embankment, initiated the construction of the railways that still runs parallel to the Ganga, west to east, connecting Patna, Patna with Kolkata. Embankments were then constructed to protect the railways where it most often tended to flood. Raised from the landscape by definition, embankments have quickly become an organizational principle for mobility. More recently, other roads were built where possible raised from the floodplain as well. Roads were built mostly perpendicular or diagonally to connect, to connect the main frame constituted by the railways and the embankments. This is visible on satellite maps, where the direction of the infrastructure aligns with the Ganges River perpendicular and 45 degrees orientation. This is the case both east of the Kozi, where the river flows west to east, and thus the grid is oriented along the north-south axis, and west of the Kozi, where the Ganges flows 30 degrees southeast, thus the infrastructural grid is inclined in the same direction. So if you have a river woven, constantly flooded landscape on which a tight grid of elevated infrastructure have been encrusted, for anyone who has a sense about the water environment, this is the best recipe for a disaster. In theory, embankments, which are walls, which are running parallel to the river, were built to control floods. In theory, by constraining the river, they would increase the water erosive capacity to, and use it to score the riverbed, leading to a much desired incised channel capable of withstanding flow variabilities. 
In theory, the erosive capacity would carry sediments downstream to the delta, and the inside channel would stabilize the river once and for all. In practice, the rivers of North Bihar have proven the theory wrong. Embankments have upset the fluvial morphology. The sediments that would have dispersed into the surrounding floodplain during a physiological flood instead concentrate within the channel. The resulting buildup causes accrual of the riverbed. An accrued bed impedes the convergence of tributaries, which are now lower, and therefore, Either the riverbed needs to be constantly dredged, which is an unfeasible proposition, or more embankments need to be constructed along the tributaries. Heavier than usual flows that would normally travel into the floodplain instead concentrate and rise within the embankments, causing turbulent whirlpools that breach the infrastructure and thus generate disastrous floods. Embankments are in continuous need of repair, maintenance, and expansions. Embankments have been the magnifiers of flood, aggravating the situation in multiple ways, making floods longer, less predictable, more frequent, more harmful. And they're also difficult to get rid because they are self-reproducing technologies whose landscape becomes addicted to them in constant need of more embankments, higher embankments, double and triple embankments. As far as I know, after reaching 5,000 kilometers and off almost half of the state budget on several years, the state of Bihar has stopped counting its embankment. I don't want to bore you with more ideological details. The problem, in my opinion, is that they are built on something that I call the, an ecology of absences, a purposely abstract narrative, systematic in its erasures. The theory of embankments hinges on the cursive construction of an abstracted river, abstracted in both shape and nature. It stands on a cartographic linear understanding of a river, mapped as a two-dimensional channel of water moving through linear space, considered through its physics and mechanics. The embankment deprives the river of its space, as if it was not inserted into a multi-dimensional ecology. It deprives a river of its history, as if it didn't have a past. Oh, sorry. Do you see the difference? I'm not saying that the theory of embankments is ignorance. I'm interested in understanding these missing factors as knowledge, not lack of knowledge. This knowledge reveals a specific aesthetic. And aesthetikos in Greek means the theory of proportion, of movement, and of balance. And includes a morphology, a theory of shapes, forms, and figures. Such morphology part of a theory of an ecology of absences, enable such technologies to thrive in their regime of expertise and yet condemn them to failure in the wet times of climate change. And this is also the case for other infrastructure, either which are already in place or in the works in India, such as dams, the interlinking river project, and the new fluvial zoning project. Now, I want to talk to you about how Biharis sees this. When leaving the Himalayas and entering the floodplain, when the slope suddenly turns gentle and subtle, the powerful rivers of North Bihar find themselves freed from the direction imparted by the upper gradients of the Himalayas. Then rivers meander, not because they're unsure, about where to go, but perhaps because they enjoy staying in, slowing and deepening their breathing, releasing their sediments where they see fit. While on a map, they extend from north to south or west to east for the inhabitant of the river, who knows these rivers in the flesh, not for the occasional visitors who aspire to micro impressions, not for the faraway observer whose body does not get measured with that of the river. Rivers produce and are produced through curved motions, meandering and exploring, arching and vaulting, 
decorating the landscape, hoping on previews or new parts. Rivers design new images of themselves, convoluting as if bowing around an invisible obstacle, twisting and turning as braids in experienced hands, bending back and winding over lush lands. The rivers of North Bihar, after rushing through as bubbling juveniles, are eventually inside of each other. They can mingle, exchange their offspring. Why not visit each other's bed and enjoy each other's gifts? One of the last time I went to visit, Rakesh and his grandfather, Babaji's village, was building a containment for the incoming floods. They shape it circularly with the arch towards the southeast. While the shape of the circle in general encompasses the largest area under the same perimeter, so basically a circle is a way to maximize construction material, the rivers run west to east on the south of the village. So it's not obvious that they'll choose to cover the southeast. In fact, when I show this map to an engineer of the minor irrigation department that knows the area, and the minor irrigation department is in charge of embankments, construction, maintenance, and after discussing gradients with him, he said that this makes no sense because that embankment would actually trap the water inside. Instead, Rakesh and Babaji's neighbors know that water will come in from the plantation on the southeast, effectively accomplishing a U-turn. Also, villagers decided that they will not build a longer embankment, not for lack of construction material, but because it would either be useless or it would actually generate a rebounding countercurrent. The ways in which Bihari relates to obstruction to the river depends on their interpretation of the river as a creator, whose style as typical movement, balances, proportion, shapes, forms, and figures. Bihari often resists the physical attempts of embankments to straighten and to contain by cutting them when they deem it necessary to release the river from restraint. These acts are often read by authorities as pure sabotage. But this representation is mistaken. These events are not the deeds of seditious elements, but are generally coordinated by a large group of people, by everyone. Everyone who shares the same situated environmental knowledge. Given the high risk of getting taken over by the landslide of mud once they cut embankments, Bihari are risking their life when they release the river. Rural Biharis also narrate their dismay for the infrastructural construction against the water in myths. Once upon a time, the river Kamla was being pursued for marriage by a deceitful and crooked merchant. In order to capture her, he built a perpendicular embankment, a dam, with the idea that once the Kamla goddess would raise on top of it, he could put vermilion on her forehead and therefore marry her. The goddess helper from the fisher folk, folk's community, came to her rescue and destroyed the wall. But the merchant, however, built another wall made of bones and heights, so that the fisherman, a Hindu, considered it impure and couldn't touch it. Even after killing the merchant, the wall remained an obstacle in the physiological path of the Kamla, till a Muslim offered to help and destroy the wall. Both Hindus and Muslim, the two prevalent religious communities in the area, share the ontology of the river as curved, rounded, shape-making, agential, agential creature from which to learn and against which opposition does not make sense. In the previous section, we described embankments as mostly parallel to the river, and as opposed to dams, for example, which are perpendicular. This is a simplification, as the embankments are armed 
with spurs, which are perpendicular to the embankments, and they're built at regular intervals with the purpose of slowing down the water. The state engineer from the minor irrigation department, whom I've met inspecting the status of the embankment, told me, the spurs are the first line of defense, like the pawn in the army. Local instead, locals instead describe the spurs as a nose, as a prying intrusion into the river's body, as a turn, a torn. Not appreciating the, the impingement, the river offered targets a spur heads on. If it manages to knock it down, then the space that opens between the previous and the next spur, so, whoops, if this is knocked down, the space, whoops, this whole space here, is conducive for a whirlpool, a turbulent motion that provokes a torsion against the main structure. The rumble of the spur is precisely where the embankment is likely to breach. Had the spur not been there, people suggest, the river would be just less irritated and thus unlikely to boil over. Instead, people imagine the river through its shapes when they bring me to the river, and when they close their eyes to tell me about it, they talk about mango shapes, ovals, with smaller convex bent at one end, only one on one side. They see snake-like movements, with the body of water moving not only forward, but also sideways through the curves that widen and shorten harmoniously like a snake. They see the form of a dia, the earthen vessel used as a candle in sacred rituals. I want to conclude by giving us a sense of how important this is for us, for those of us who inhabit in this newly confused wetness, confusing wetness. Casey is a friend of mine from Mississippi, a housewife homeschooling her five children. We share a creative passion, knitting. And while our political and religious identity could sound dichotomic, we talk about everything and find more common ground than divergence. She's my go-to person for practical tips and existential reflection. This time around, she asked me for advice. She's considering moving and she wants to find a place where her family would be safe from floods. Her family already underwent a terrible flood under Harvey, lost their house and personal belonging. They are traumatized. So we look at the map together. It was not supposed to flood there, she tells me. Which shapes do you see, Kazi? Which factors would you consider? What I want you, what I want us, whoops, to carry away from this Saturday morning talk today is that urge to read the landscape, to become aware of the hidden shapes and the discourses they subsume, to uncage ourselves from embodied assumption and learn to walk on slippery grounds or unstable and friable ones to consider more factors, to acquire more information, to learn how to process it and read complex ecologies instead of believing in linear narratives. I want us to reflect on our inherited morphologies and to explore new shapes, forms and figures. I want us to take the leap towards new ways of knowing our wetter word. Thank you. Thank you so much, Luisa, for that wonderful, comprehensive talk. <laughs> we feel like we are gaining more knowledge and expanding our imagination about river and our increasingly wet world. 
you may have some questions for Luisa. Um, Athena will be joining the stage with Luisa and have a discussion. And please hold on to your question. After their discussion, we'll be opening up to the floor. I'd like to welcome Athena to the stage. See if that works. Yeah. Luisa, thank you very much for being here and for that amazing talk. And thank you also to Seattle Art Museum for inviting me as well to be a part of this today. Um, Luisa, I would like to start where you started actually with situational knowledge and just ask the basic question of why this work? Why the focus on water? Why the particular geographic location? What, what's drawn you to that? Sure, Athena, sure. Um, I'm trying to combine the two. It, I feel that North Bihar, I ended up in North Bihar by chance. And then at some point I realized that it's a place of climate change anticipation. And I started, you know, I work in, in an area which is, it's, it's pretty big. It's, is um, as big as Maryland in comparison and is as populated as California. And realizing that those people go through a disasters year in and year out for months at a time made me wonder what makes these people resistant, resilience, resilient to disasters. And who is resilient and which factors are actually making people more resilient than others. And so that's the idea of situated knowledge as well. Who are these people? Where do they live? How does that make it makes a difference? And because they are undergoing floods for so long and floods have become more and more disastrous, then what can we learn from it since we are also starting to encounter those kind of floods. Great. And it seems like in the realm of water and water-related disasters that there's this dichotomy between too much water or not enough water throughout the global environment. And I know you focus on the too much water side, but I'm wondering from your perspective, what, as, as a researcher and as a scientist and as a community member, what we're striving towards? Is it balance? Is it understanding? And um, just where we're trying to get in that dichotomy. Yeah, yeah, and I actually sort of probably um, foreseen this kind of question, and that's why I put the example of the, the parched dry ground, because I think that the problem really resides in our dichotomical way of understanding it. You know, if the, the ground is too dry, actually it's, this is the pri it's primed for floods. And so uh, several districts of, districts of Bihar are uh, drought prone and flood prone. And sometimes they declare a drought and then the next month they declare a flood. So that opposition, this is a place of drought, this is a place of flood, it, it's not, not there anymore. And we, are, we start encountering floods in areas which we have considered dry for a, for, for a long time and drought in places that we said we have considered wet for a long time. Uh, so I think a lot of this it resides in our ways of categorizing things and categorizing things in opposition to each other. It, that black and white sort of mentality. That's a fantastic segue to my next question, <laughs> which was, so a lot of your work focuses on the intersection of social sciences and um, more natural science or Western ways of knowing and more traditional ways of knowing, like some of the children's examples that you brought up. And it seems that we're at least headed in the direction of there's a much um, deeper understanding of the need for these more complex and transdisciplinary answers to some of these global problems. But 
in putting that to work in effect in situations and areas where it's been very siloed in the past, where you have your social sciences and your natural sciences, and having to break down those silos either in an academic setting, which can sometimes be very you know, challenging or philanthropic. What has been your experience in trying to, to break down some of that separation and bring that transdisciplinarity to the forefront? Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful question, Athena, and pretty complicated too as well, right? Because on one side, um, I was super lucky to have that opportunity to study both as an anthropologist, as an environmental anthropologist, and as an environmental scientist at the same time. Um, but also, one of my questions when I went back to Bihar after these studies was, I'm not going to impose all these categories into the ways in, in my conversation with people, really. I'm not gonna go there and start using the jargon that I've learned in grad school. So how am I gonna figure out uh, the ways to incorporate those form of knowledge together? And that's a, that's a deep epistemological question, actually, and it's a methodological question a lot of us are struggling with. And then I realized that, first of all, um, can my environmental science understanding enable me to grasp their knowledge a lot better because I put myself into that humble position of the learner. And instead of uh, you know, looking at each other, which very often happens in context, in, in interaction between strangers. So I open a parenthesis, since I work in this very large area, I'm not a traditional anthropologist that goes to a village and spend, uh, spend years in, in, or, or months and months in the same place. So I don't necessarily, I do that in a few places, but I don't necessarily have that sustained relationship with all my, my interlocutors. So often interaction end up being about who are you? Why are you here? What are you earning for coming here and asking me this question? Um, and so a lot about each other instead of being on the stuff that are surrounding us. And, Instead, my ability, to, so my, my learning on environmental science enabled me to go straight to, to bring that in an anthropological sensibility and to go straight to, I mean, of course, after figuring it out who, which, who, who we are, and to go into that discussion on water and land and agriculture and drinking, et cetera, that was, was what I was there for. And I think it made me realize a lot more uh, the, a lot more their deep understanding of the space around them, which I hadn't figured out before, even if I lived in the area for two years. But I believe that that was possible also because I was an anthropologist, so also because I had, had years and years of training, which, you know, I don't know what the other way around would have been. It's not my situated experience. On another side, and sorry if I'm taking too long, but I'm thinking that you also bring in an, in, uh, an opposition between Western um, science and, and indigenous knowledge, which is another opposition I am really not happy with. Um, and some of my discussion today was actually to bring in and say, hey, what's your knowledge about your environment? Do you re are you really sure that this is, this is just about Western knowledge? And it, a way I have to explain it, I found to explain it was when I started question, I started asking people a question, which I'm gonna ask to, to some of you if you don't mind. I want to volunteer though. Uh, the question is, before anyone volunteers, uh, <laughs> must be scared. The question is, what's water? Does someone want to try it out? Please. Sorry? Life. Wonderful. And some more? Yeah. It's the profound reason we exist, and it's essential to everything. Confession, I'm an open water swimmer. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you like the sea images. <laughs> what else? That's very profound. 
some other answer? Because I think I've, I've sort of primed you a little bit. You are not any more, uh, you know, <laughs> in a, sort of a un, you know, an uninformed person to ask this question to. But I, I have to say, I have been so balked with this question that I literally sort of sit on a train and ask the other person that whoever dares to enter in conversation with me, oh, by the way, what's water for you? <laughs> so any, anyone else? Yeah, we are 80% water. As humans, we are 80% water. Okay. And if you live in Seattle, you I are 90% water. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful, thank you. Well, it's just striking me that all of us are birthed in water. And it has never occurred. And I've been getting lately more close to the concept of embodiment. And I'm very touched by indigenous people and cultures that as a white person, no, we don't pay any attention to that stuff. But thank you. I mean, just never thought of that. We all live in water to get here. Yeah. You know, the answer that I receive most of the time, now I forgot the percentage that I wrote on this, but it's like beyond 50% for sure, is that water is, is H2O. <laughs> Did anyone thought about it? Like, confess it. Come on. Okay, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks for confessing it. And then, when I get that, my follow-up question is, okay, would you mind, sorry for the chemistry exam, but would you mind telling me a couple of other molecules? Just the first one that occurs to your mind. And a lot of people freeze and say, oh, oh, wait, wait a second. They maybe marvel, you know, something like NACL, NACL or CO2, or, but then, like, no, no, chemistry is not my strong suit, whatever. And then I say, well, so explain then to me why the most mundane substance ever that you encounter several times in your day, that you realize that as a wet materiality, you cannot notice it. it, can be like hair, which we take for granted, where we, what we are made of in large, the largest part of our body, that where we were born from, how is it that you take it, you take a language which is completely foreign to you in order to express that? So I have a few explanations for this and I'm not gonna bore you too much about it, but one of the possibility, the most obvious possibility, then, and there are others which are a little more sophisticated, but the most obvious possibility is that we sort of learn that language and it sticks with us, and maybe it doesn't mean anything anymore. It becomes H2O, which isn't written as H2O, but is written as, you know, A, C, whatever, like it's spelled out, it's basically a word, it's not H2O the same way, but so it's a loan word that then we transform and give another meaning to. But it's still interesting that we just use, it's, it's almost like, you know, yeah, I studied Arabic a few years ago. It's almost as if I would call my mother in Arabic. Why would I use a language which is foreign to me to call something which is so important, so structural, so uh, mundane, so obvious, so, so recurrent in my life? So building off that concept then of, of language and voice, I'm also curious how in your work you've been able to bring in underrepresented voices in the water space. Because often water and access to water is connected and can be connected to power and politics and is often a male dominated space largely. Um, but so I'm wondering, you know, for, for instance, the knowledge that the children held or um, women in societies and how those voices come up in creating solutions to, to some of these problems. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's, it's radical for me to think about it. And actually, the question that I've asked about uh, which are the factors that make people resilient to disaster is spelled out exactly in terms of uh, vulnerabilities. So in terms of caste, uh, caste first actually, in terms of religion, 
in terms of gender, in terms of place of habitation, which is connected to caste as well. So I work mostly in the area inside the river embankments and in areas which are uh, inhabited by the caste, which are considered, is not a language that I'm assuming, as the lowest of the hierarchy uh, and with, with Muslim communities. Uh, I'm also, you know, I've also been privileged by having identities that shifted in, during my stay in Bihar. Initially, I was part of uh, NGOs where I would hire an equal, I would be careful about the, the caste and religion of, uh, of the people that I was hiring and I would hire it as a principal uh, in, in every five teams of 12 people each, so always six men and six women. And um, I also tried to hire a third gender, but it didn't, it wasn't interesting enough uh, for them. Uh, the, when I was working with these NGOs and I had somehow a position of power, even if I was hired locally, I had a local salary, uh, there was no international collaboration, so on, uh, I was considered a man. So people would call me sir. And then, uh, madam, uh, sir, sir. Um, then when I went back for fieldwork as a researcher, I, I was stripped of that power and I became a madam. Um, but then I went back with my daughter who was just born during my fieldwork and uh, I was a lot more a woman than ever and I was uh, invited into people's houses all the time. There was no way I was gonna talk with a man ever again. I was also you know, carrying a baby on me and sort of breastfeeding inside my, my clothes, etc. and therefore, and then I went back again with my second uh, child, who is a boy. And then there I, I acquired a totally different identity too. And of course that was also mediated by the clothes I was wearing. Since in the, during the first period, uh, I underwent these very long floods and I was, I was uh, um, crossing rivers uh, very often on boats that sometimes would capsize. I, whenever I knew I was crossing a river, I wasn't wearing a sari, but I was wearing uh, a kurta pyjama, which is something like I'm wearing today, but with pants below. And with pants which are were most likely by men. And so that sort of helped, uh, you know, identify me as a sir, and with hair tighten up, etc. And then um, later on, when I had a little more time to, to to speak with people, I would wear a sari on an every day, and then later on I had the baby on me, as I explained, etc. So there were, there were other indication of my uh, confusing mixed identity, but um, I forgot the kind of the origin of this question. <laughs> <laughs> Where I was going with it. Um, about Remind me, Athena how you're able to oh, right. draw on it. Yep. See, right. So I think that's one of <laughs> So yeah, I was still on track. So that sort of allowed me to speak with, uh, with different people in different ways as well. And allow me, when, when I was open the door of the houses and I was asked to come in the bedroom and sit on the bed and stay there for, for some time, I sort of got into a completely different, you know, understanding and space. Uh, and that's for the gender part. And, uh, you know, I'm happy to elaborate more in terms of caste, but I think I spoke about it. Um, for example, the myth on it's, it's a myth from the fisher folks community, which is considered a lower caste. And I found it fascinating. And the reason I mention it is because they, uh, the, what the myth says is that the, the goddess needs the Muslim in order to overcome the problem. And it's, it's a fabulous idea of synergies between different communities that are nowadays politically opposed in, in you know, terrible ways. Mm -hmm. And also connected to this concept and, and the talk we're having here, I know you didn't bring up the term in your presentation, but your lab uses the term water justice. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what that means to you and your work and how it fits into the broader realm of environmental justice, which I'm sure a lot in the audience are familiar with. It's a, right, there's a push and maybe it's more 
environmental justice should be a part of water justice. It might be the flip um, <laughs> of that potentially. Uh, but yeah, just, just how you all think of that term and why it's important to call that out on its own, water justice specifically. Yeah. I think there's more and more attention to the idea of environmental justice, which is wonderful. In my um, con contextual experience, it doesn't, it isn't sufficient to, it's, it's sort of too vague. And I think, you know, um, I want to bring down things to how, to the, the, to the mechanism through which they happen, to the, f the, the matter that, that, that matters. So, um, so I, found, I found that water justice is, is somehow its whole thing. It helps us to understand a set of other factors which aren't obvious when we talk about environmental justice somehow. So today I use environmental knowledge, but I could have used water knowledge to be a little more precise perhaps. And um, for example, the fact that it does, that living in a wetter world does require us a set of knowledge which are specific to water. And, and that those knowledges are our right in a way. I feel it should be sort of a fundamental right much more than just obtaining water. Like I, I find disgraceful to use a, you know, a kind of polite term. Um, the fact that we, we have very little sense of the water that we drink and that we need and how to access it and what's in it and how to make sure that it's clean enough for us to drink. The fact that we have a tap we open and get water from and someone who says that's clean enough for drinking, we have seen in so many cases, I mean, of course, Flint, Michigan is the first one that comes to mind, but there are plenty everywhere, how this is problematic. It's problematic that we have a, a very hard time to uh, figure out where to get water f that is safe for drinking and, and how to discuss with our authorities about it. And, and I think that's better explained once we use the term water justice, once we contextualize it to uh, that particular matter. And of course, floods and drinking water contamination are two very different things. And yet, it's important also to name it water because it's somehow the same substance, it's finite, it, it, it mingles in, you know, this, some of these people here are, I'm pretty sure, I'm not, maybe not in these photographs, but in any, any situation like this, some of these people are using this water for bathing, for cleansing, for drinking, for a variety of purposes. Uh, they have ways to understand what's, what's good for what, but at the same time, uh, we are at a loss in figuring these things out. The situation is very different from what it was a long time ago, where those knowledges were tra transmitted intergenerationally. Um, I'm qualified in the water, in you know, in in the biogeochemistry of water, and yet I will, I, I just moved house. I have to, I need to get analysis done. I'm. I don't really know, you know, it's, um, so that's why I think using water help us to get to the point of this is, that's what, what, what's the matter is. Mm -hmm. And in this understanding of water, I'm interested in the idea of shapes that you brought up in your talk. And I'm wondering if you have any additional examples of shapes of water or how the audience can think about it differently. Yeah, absolutely. There was an example that I really want to bring in, actually, and I um, I couldn't, in part because I was introducing you to so many of my friends already, but also because uh, I just didn't have a picture, and I wish I had that. Um, there's a, a, another, a woman I got to know. Her name is Mary, and I, I think she's from... Sarlet, I believe it's in Minnesota, but she moved around. Uh, uh, I don't know if this this name, this, my geographical knowledge is, is appropriate, but she moved around a lot around the Mississippi, and um, and at some point she was. Um, we were on on some some completely unrelated to work project together, and uh, she 
got to know I work on rivers and water, etc. And she told me very proudly that her house was on the Mississippi River, was close to the Mississippi River, and showed me pictures of it. And um, when I saw how close it was, I said, "Well, uh, how is the structure of the house doing?" You know, I. She showed me the map, and I suspected that her house was. I said, well, I suspect her, your house is sort of more on the Mississippi River than close to the Mississippi River. Uh, and she, you know, like, not really, but so when we get to speak about this, the, the structure of it, she sort of conceded that uh, there was water in the garage, that, but there were barriers, but why would water enter in the garage, et cetera, et cetera. Then she showed me this, this pics of the house. And I started seeing that the shapes, the lines of the right part of the house were not as straight as the lines of the left part of the house. And they were sort of plunging down. And I pointed to her and say, okay, let's, let's, you know, draw lines here. Um, and then she, she sort of realized and say, oh, so this is, she was a little confused because the river is actually on the left side. But when I explained to her what, you know, what the Vados area is, what I break, I mean, some of the, I tried to explain that, and then I realized that it wasn't, there was no point discussing all this jargon that we scientists fill our mouth with. And, and then she insisted that her house was not on the flood map. So there was, I was mistaken. And, you know, yes, she could see the shapes, but. And then I, I started thinking for a while, like, what, are, what is a word that I can use to convince her what, sort of let up my linguistic game, instead of using all this jargon, let's use a word to convince her and to have, like, why do, do people listen to the insurance company more than, uh, so I found this idea of Waterland, which is actually the title of a wonderful uh, book by Graham Swift. Uh, and, and then I think we got to a different understanding once that I started using a word that was able to express the shapes as well. So my answer to your question, I took a long route, I always do that, was that uh, the shape were really our entry point uh, for, as a factor to consider for her to rethink about the land on which her house was standing. And then we also had to find some linguistic convergence to actually speak about it. And so the, the term waterland on which I've been writing, it's helped us to think about a place which is water and land. It isn't mud, but it isn't. Uh, and you know, if I would have used wet, wet land, it would have meant something completely different as well. And she wouldn't have agreed to it. So, so I think it's the shape and the way we also find languages to express our word, which need to make sense for us. We need to see them, we need to feel them. And that is, you know, a way in which we learn. Um, I hope it makes sense. Yeah, and Waterland, I love that. And I think uh, maybe we'll start referring to Seattle as Waterland. <laughs> um, I have a few more questions here, but I do want to make sure we have time for any audience questions, so. I will pause and see if anybody has questions. Um, I know your talk isn't finished in terms of the Q&A, but I want to really express um, amazement and delight at the rich intellectual, moral, spiritual, embodied nature of what you've done. And forgive me, but I'm um, a, a film curator for Tazvir.org, which is the country's largest South Asian film festival. It's in Seattle now, and there are films on climate change and villages in Pakistan affected by flooding. Anyone who's interested, I have a coupon and information. But here, forgive me for that, but it's so appropriate, and I don't get a kickback. Um, I'm in I, <laughs> and, um, I lived in Himachal Pradesh and taught at Central University of Himachal Pradesh, living in Gamru near the Bees River. And um, I've also walked the five miles of the Yamana River. Um, I'm 
an elder who's trying to coordinate with someone who will help me walk a large portion of the Ganga. So water is in me, but I'm reminded of my research scholars at Central University, and research scholars are those who are working on their PhD. One of them, Yashpal, was 36, and his mother was illiterate, and here he is, and he has gotten his PhD, he's an example. But he mourned the loss of his indigenous knowledge. He valued, as do others, what academics don't know. And there's a tension there I find extraordinarily interesting. And um, also it deals with gendered aspects of how you experience the land. So I wondered if you saw in your incredible research, which to me is all about the environmental humanities, um, that kind of understanding on the part of other um, folks in Bihar and elsewhere, that they might be educated, but they don't know squat. Or squat, another word for that is zip, nada. Okay. Yeah, yeah, of course I get it. Um, well, first of all, I, of, of course, but you know, part of what I was trying to say is also, we, none of us does, and that's what, you know, I, anthropologists find it a little uncomfortable when I say we, but I think we are sort of part of this ignorance. It's a community of practice that, that is practice, practicing ignorance on a, on a lot of matters that are so fundamental for us. And, uh, and you know, some of, some of what you find is not only, which I find even more worrisome, is not only that complete disregard for a knowledge that has been passed on for generations, but also the sense that, and, and some people have it, the sense that it's not anymore needed. And incredibly, this is what a lot of educated people feel. Right, so the kind of the minor uh, irrigation department engineer who says, no, these people are completely wrong. They don't get a clue. They live there, whatever. They don't have a sense of what to do with their environment. So, so that, that opposition that says, no, that, that knowledge, is, it was all wrong. It was wrong because it was mythical. It was wrong because it's religious oriented and so on. And I'm not simply celebrating uh, knowledge for the sake of, there is, there is a lot of power relation which are inserted into a lot of knowledge as well. Things are a lot more complicated than what I, I may seem to, to portray. But on the other side, um, unless we realize that we are at the loss, we want, and that our education isn't really helping, then I don't think that we are gonna be really confident. I mean, in a way, it seems to me that we have water at our ankle and we are filing our nails away. Uh, you know, everything is chilled, everything is fine, but not, not really. Like, we are in a, in, a, in a complicated situation and we should try, start putting more attention. So thanks for uh, find, you know, allowing me to find another way to uh, metaphorically put down the message of my talk. Um, I was fascinated with the uh, way you talk about language, um, what was it, Co linguistic convergence. And I know in Hawaii there are, there are many terms for rain, in you know, classic in other languages. I wondered if you found words in Bihari that could not be translated without the situated knowledge, and if you were able to bring them back in a way that people might be able to use them in their own environment? Sure. Uh, you have to allow me this, um, my Italian up upbringing to come up. I know that uh, some people find it annoying when, if I start uh, saying Latin words, but uh, in Latin, the word trado translates for, uh, means translate, and it also means betray. Isn't that fascinating? The fact that you have a word that exactly means that every time you translate, somehow you betray, right? So it, 
it happens all the time. A lot of my work, for example, is on the concept of nature and uh, the fact that they the use the word that people use is, uh, you know, is it really, is it really nature? Can it really use? Can it really translate? So it happens constantly to me to think what exactly is um, is what I'm doing. But on the other side, it's also helpful that a lot of people are bilingual and uh, bilingual for real. They have two native languages, and so they help me to see. And so, so most of my conversation, even when I now listen to my recordings, uh, were okay. Let's talk about this word again. What is that? Is this, a right, is this the right translation? Are you really sure? Can we actually use that? Let's make examples. Let's make sentences. On another side, there's also another linguistic level, which is as important and has nothing to do with words. You say, is this a linguistic level? How is it? No, the, what we call, as linguistic anthropologists, uh, semiotic, which doesn't have anything to do with the meaning of the word, which is semantics. It has to do with the way in which we communicate without using words. And actually, a lot of it is about gesturing, but it's also about assigning meanings to things without necessarily using the word per se. So when you bring in linguistic convergence, it's actually even beyond <laughs> words and the complication of um, of translating. Having said that, um, yes, of course, and the first, uh, the, my answer to your question is yes, of course, there are words that mean a lot more than what the translation can say. And for example, one example, one, one thing, the first thing that comes to my mind is water. The fact that there are two different words for water and they mean something different, but they overlap in so many ways that you could, I mean, I'm sure someone has done it already, but you write a chapter on Pani and Jal, the two words they use for, it's just, it's, it's just endless to make a distinction, but to explain how they keep on converging. It seems to be one is religious one, and, but then you realize that it's not. Jal seems to be the sacred water, but then it's also used when, for drainage, so how those, those two things match, you know? So uh, yes, this complication of the language are fascinating, and yet you need to go beyond the language too. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I had a question about the spurs. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, my, my understanding was that there was, um, a desire by local people to kind of uh, destroy part of them or allow water to go through it in support of the river uh, and what the river needed or wanted to do. So I'm assuming that those things were built in some ways to control flooding. Um, so in the desire to break this down, how do the locals feel about flooding? Is that something that they feel that they can live with? And is that possible in the future? Or, um, like, it, kind of, is there a solution there somewhere? Yeah. So your question sort of applies to spurs, but it also applies to embankments in a way and to any opposition of the river, right? Yeah. So um, the physiological floods that happened before embankments were a situation where the water would spill out of the river slowly and the river, there was not real a gradient between the river and the floodplain. The water would spread slowly, it would uh, reach large extent, but then would always be pretty shallow and would sort of recede quickly, either by percolation or by going back into the river. And um, so the flood was actually effectively a fifth season and was celebrated by a variety of festivals and so on. Um, there are a number of uh, arrangements related to marriages and traditions, etc., that that are um, conducive and interestingly related to floods. Um, what happened since the, these, these technologies got encrusted in the environment and the, in the landscape and, um, and became and slowly changed the uh, morphology both on the surface but also under uh, underground. So the drainage of the, of the land in, in terms of the watershed, right? In terms of the fact that the river is also a drainage channel, uh, both 
on the surface and, and below the ground. Uh, that drainage, um, we could call it system, although I'm not so, I, I think the word system has some complications too, sort of got, um, got messed up by the embankments. And since then, uh, part of what I explained was also how the riverbed, I didn't really explain the underground, but how the riverbed changed because of the sediments that are carried by the river, which weren't really accounted for that much in that theory of embankments as it was uh, written, carried forward, and et cetera. And, um, uh, and, and actually, that, uh, like my mind is going on a tangent, but I think it's interesting because it was a conversation between the engineers of the Army Corp of Engineers in the US on the that were working on the Mississippi and the engineers in, uh, in India that were sent by the government to learn from the Army Corps of Engineers uh, about embankments and, and how to build them and sluice gate, etc. So um, people feel that, that that attempt to, they sell it to bind the river and bind water is, uh, is absurd and unnecessary. Uh, there are mixed feelings, of course, and there are, there are contested opinion on all grounds, but it seems pretty obvious at this point, and most of the Indian bureaucracy has also written and accepted this fact that the, the river has been, the embankments have been counterproductive. Um, so the question is, should we knock them down uh, or not? And, and the, my answer is that the, it's something that I think physicists call hysteresis, is that the way, the way in which we got there cannot simply be taken back the same way and we can't go back to where we started that easily. Do you see what I'm saying? So it's not as easy as to just knock something down and go back to it. And that's what we often, that mentality of, um, of building something or of, uh, you know, was probably, is probably also, um, that's something I'm, I'm thinking of, so please don't cite me as well as yet. I haven't done enough research on this. That's what, something I plan to do. But it also, also has to do with the fact that most of the people who uh, work on this in India were civil engineers. So they had that, that uh, proclivity to build things, right? And so I, and, and so are the bureaucrats that were, were involved into this discussion historically. So in a way, um, that idea of I'm building this to fix it and then I'll, I'll see what it goes and if there are consequences I'm not happy with, then I'll find another device that will, will, will take care of the consequences that I'm not happy with. And then if something else happens, then I'll, I'll also find another pill to solve, another technology to solve the problem. So what people feel is that this, uh, this bound bound water isn't really something logical in any possible way. And, and uh, the spur particularly are considered as some a, a nuisance to the river, even to the river body. Uh, technically, what they argue is that uh, when the river is passing close to the, to the, uh, to the embankments, the spur should slow down the, the, the water, but in fact, what they act, what they say they do is they um, they get knocked down and then one, when one is knocked down then, then the, the space between two is the perfect space to create a whirlpool which then is and this is precisely the place where the embankment get uh, get breached so what they say is if you look at all these spurs uh, you see kind of they see a history of the breach happening exactly when a spur has been knocked down and they say this is this isn't uh, by chance which is a way for them to demonstrate that that's that sort of that's uh, binded that's caging the river uh, through structure isn't isn't logical it's not the way to go but then nobody really has an answer on what's the way to go either Um, is this okay? <laughs> so, where to go? Um, you just uh, sparked in me a question about um, whether or not you encountered quest uh, discussions of migration, because I think what the other Western side of our thinking that this is butting up against is just property ownership and what land, how people can say, this is my land, but then the river will take it and our instinct to preserve those 
uh, the property versus what you're encountering in these regions where probably for thousands of years people have had to move with a river and how they accommodate that within their worldview and their emotional reaction to these dynamic systems. We, we have a static, more of a static science here. And uh, so what did you encounter? Ooh, you got into, you opened like this huge chapter of, you know, of a huge topic of discussion because of course people um, have been moving and they also prime their life in order to move. I, you made me realize I haven't shown you as much as the villages as I should have. And you would see a lot of houses which are uh, constructed by walls of bamboos. And those walls of bamboos are very quickly taken down. You need a bullock cart, put them on and move out. Uh, although now uh, Prestige is bringing houses which are made of bricks. And so when you have a house made of bricks, and you see the river coming closer, then people try to save the brick one by one, and you find you find you know uh, people coming together to with with hammers and and objects to break the houses down and to carry the bricks away, which is incredible. The kind of the sensorial aspect of it, it's really like the the hammering, the taking down, like rhythmic hammering of taking the all. In this, through the same rhythm, taking down one brick at, at a time. Um, because during the flood season, because the flood season is now much more destructive and the festival are not, you know, so often can't happen really, then a lot of people also leave during the flood season. And so temporary migration during the flood months is really common in the villages to the point in which you find a lot of the villages inside the river or close to the river to be inhabited by women 80%, 90%. You find only a few men in the villages, which is also complicated when, uh, becomes complicated then to, to take down a house quickly and to carry children and, ca and cattle and, and whatever outside of, of the river. Uh, the migration aspect, um, you know, isn't, it, it's of course enhanced by the floods, uh, and then, of course, to it, you also have the property question about, so how are people dealing with the property of the land that is taken away by the river, uh, which is a very bureaucratic, like I don't want to get into a lot of bureaucratic uh, examples here, but, but people are sort of used to move the villages in different location, and so I often find since I've been going there on and off since 2007 that I see a village which is new to me and then people greet me and say, hey, we've met a few years ago. I say, oh, but we weren't here, we were over there and it's the same village or we change it. Some people came, some other people didn't and they, um, and so the, that also means that a lot of the places where they come to live aren't necessarily of their property and the area inside the river isn't necessarily uh, an area that they own and they get into arrangements with landlords that are often very violent. So actually this, this situation creates a lot, of, uh, a lot of complication in terms of, of uh, the, this property situation creates complication in terms of, um, of who wants the land for what and, and that violent casteism gets uh, enhanced because of, of that situation. Did I answer your question, honestly, or there was more to it and I didn't get there? Okay. I'm, um, I'm gonna read the room here and a lot of people are leaving because I think caffeine supplies are getting low. So we have, go ahead, let's take one more question and then we'll go ahead and wrap up. But I'm Is happy it on to now? Say yeah. Um, I found very interesting one aspect of your talk in which you cited a couple of times examples of how the folks in Bihar would attribute to uh, spiritual forces, mm -hmm. river gods or other kinds of gods, uh, various different um, causes and results. And I find it interesting that uh, the Western scientific approach is, of course, to just accept uh, something as it is and try to characterize it. Whereas in a more spiritual th 
thing, one attempts to bring the unseen world into the seen world as a causing factor. And I'm suspecting you've given some thought to the uh, amount of spiritualism that is inherent in a non-technological society, and perhaps maybe you can talk about that. Thank you. I love the difficult question at the end of things. You know, it's like the cherry on the cake. Um, so first of all, I appreciate and, uh, and thank you for using the word spiritualism instead of the word uh, religion, which is sometimes, uh, you know, used mistakenly one for the other. Uh, it's interesting because, of course, a given, particularly given the, the division in, um, in caste in the Hindu society, you have very different spiritualism or spiritual uh, word uh, in, in different groups of people in different communities. And, however, the Hindu religion is also homogenized in some ways that often takes over other, the different forms of spiritualism across different groups. So often, this, the river is, is, conce is conceived as a goddess, and, and that is kind of the language, but also the door through which some of the, the invisible forces are expressed. And this is problematic also because it doesn't resonate with the fact that there are many Muslim, a few Christian, but mostly Muslim, living in the area as, as well. And, uh, and, and so a lot of the literature on it, uh, to my dismay, then characterize the river as a goddess and uh, in a way that makes it belong only, not only to Hindu, but also only to certain castes and not to others. Uh, and so it's almost as if, it's almost as an embankment really, it's almost as if we are constraining something which was spreading in so many directions in our life into a one single discourse uh, which doesn't necessarily work for everyone and doesn't necessarily work in particular for this, this situation in which the society is composed by, by a variety of, of people, not to mention indigenous communities, which aren't so frequent in Bihar, but are in, um, in one of the areas where I work, West Champaran, so the upper uh, west part of, the north, of North Bihar. The way in which those spiritual forces uh, mingle, enter in the language of technology, as you rightly say, is particularly fascinating because it's almost as if, and I'm using sort of a simplistic a simplistic um, explanation here, which is also tentative. It's not something I've thought about it so clearly, but it's almost as if uh, they help expressing the strains with technology. It's almost as if the strain, the difficulties of dealing with those technologies are not so easily expressed in the language of the visible forces, and therefore the the spiritual forces give a hand in expressing why technology doesn't really help so much with it. I don't know if that, that's something that makes sense. So it becomes a really powerful way to express something which we don't have so many other ways to express. And, and it's necessary, but it's also, um, it's also in often encounters boundaries in communicating. And one of the most common boundaries is something that we, um, we social scientists call Orientalism, which is the stereotypization of the other. And a, a common way of doing that is to say that the indigenous, the the, uh, the poor, the person who is just another, who just lives somewhere, particularly in Asia somewhere, is very different from us and is a spiritual being while we aren't. We are Western scientists, all of us, right? So this, this, this absurdity 
uh, often, in my opinion, becomes as an obstacle to the, that um, that uh, you know that owning a language which may not be which maybe which is spiritual for and it could be spiritual for all of us regardless of and and it doesn't have to be different from someone who live in Asia from someone who live you know my teenager friends in in uh, in in that island in near Sicily and so the the point of actually bringing bringing uh, these uh, these uh, these other examples in my talk from the US from from uh, a global a global uh, citizen like Susanna or or my friends from Sicily was also to break that the stereotypization of the the poor uh, oriental knowledge and and being as much more oriented towards spiritualism than and and towards explaining the forces of nature as others are like the 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 Marco and Gianni the two boys are talking about the the sea in extremely deep spiritual ways and they're also talking about the sea, and they're also choosing the sea vis-a-vis -vis other technological entertainment such as the PlayStation. And they're also finding, you know, that language to express uh, the, the, the shortcomings of, of uh, and the interplay between the technology such as the boat and, and their, their need to be with the sea, on the sea, off the sea. I hope it makes sense. I have one question to close us out here. Um, so a lot of the news today around the intersection of climate and people can be really disheartening. Um, extreme weather events causing displacement and illness and death. What are signs of hope or opportunity that you see, if any? <laughs> I, ideally one. <laughs> I'm going to sort of disagree here <laughs> in the sense that I find, um, I find this very teleological somehow, the fact that we need, we need hope at the end of the story. Like we need to have the happy ending. I, I, I think maybe we are sort of, it's not about your question, Athena, at all. It's about the way in which uh, I see even a lot of my colleagues, the direction which I see a lot of my colleagues, or a lot of the stories we say going. I don't think it's an issue of, uh, of you know, feeling good about things and saying, oh, well, there is a way. Like, I, I, my work, I think it's about the mechanism through which things happen. I mean, maybe I'm more of an environmental scientist than I actually ever thought. But it's, um, it, I wanna, I want to, to sort of stop with that guilty feeling of what we have we done and we need to find the hero that is saving the world uh, and bringing us hope and making us, you know, go, get to the happy ending of the story uh, and to think that, uh, yeah, we're in trouble and we have to find a way to get, get, uh, get going. There's no, yeah, I sort of refuse to get into that, that sort of narrative. And I know that this is, I, I, I appreciate that this is a very common narrative and it's, a, it's, a, it's just, I don't, I'm not comfortable with it. I think it's a very um, fairy tales addicted <laughs> sort of way of seeing the world or. Um. Well, on that end, I think it's actually a great place to kind of think about, you have offered so many generative questions instead of um, nice packaged, finished ending. So thank you for sending us to pave our better world with more questions and actually really so much insight and centering actually the climate refugees as like place and people to lean into and listen, which is amazing. Thank you, Athena, for an amazing set of questions. And thanks to you all for staying this long and amazing dialogues and questions. So join me for welcome. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you all.